Welcome to the Good News Ride Home for Tuesday, May 26th, 2020. I'm Jackson Bird. Young people are getting sick with COVID-19 in very high numbers in Brazil. A rundown on what we know and don't know at this point, and an argument against immunity passports. Plus, SpaceX's Crew Dragon launches tomorrow, a new space tax proposal, the world's oldest living cat celebrates his birthday, how to get free pizza if you're a graduating senior, and Catholic priests' new weapon to fight coronavirus. On Friday, New York State's death toll dropped below 100 for the first time since March. It was back up to 146 on Saturday, but has since remained below 100. Ireland on Monday had their first day with zero deaths since the end of March, which their chief medical officer says is consistent with their pattern of reduction. Italy, too, had good news reporting their lowest number of new cases since February. Meanwhile, however, the virus continues to rampage through much of South and Central America, and a new worrisome trend is emerging. More young people are dying than in other nations, quoting the Washington Post. In Brazil, 15% of deaths have been people under 50, a rate more than 10 times greater than in Italy or Spain. In Mexico, the trend is even more stark. Nearly one-fourth of the dead have been between 25 and 49. In India, officials reported this month that nearly half of the dead were younger than 60. In Rio de Janeiro State, more than two-thirds of hospitalizations are for people younger than 49, end quote. Analysts are pointing to poverty, population density, extreme inequality, and fragile health systems as among the possible reasons for this stark phenomenon. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., about a dozen states are reporting upticks in cases, quoting the New York Times, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and Tennessee are among the states that have had recent growth in newly reported new cases several weeks after moving to reopen. Arkansas, North Dakota, and Oklahoma, which did not have statewide stay-at-home orders put in place but began reopening businesses, are also reporting an uptick in new cases. End quote. This could be reflective of an increase in testing, though as the Times points out, it also shows that despite overall national trends decreasing, quote, the virus's grip on the country is far from over. The New York Stock Exchange trading floor reopened this morning with new social distancing and face covering protocols put in place. Not all positions will be returning but the floor brokers and trading floor officials who do must agree not to use public transportation, have their temperature taken upon entry, and refrain from physical interaction like shaking hands. The Dow surged 600 points at the opening bell this morning, which was rung in by Governor Cuomo. So emergency medical doctor Megan Ranney had a great Twitter thread over the weekend outlining everything that we know and don't know about coronavirus right now. And I thought it was a pretty great refresher to just kind of take the pulse of the situation at the moment. So I'm going to quote just about the whole thing here. She does link out to sources for everything that she states. So if you want to see those, link is in the show notes. All right. So quoting her Twitter thread, number one. We don't yet know the true case fatality rate, e.g. if you catch it, how likely are you to die? Scientists agree that the CDC's numbers are likely underestimates, but it's at least four times more deadly than the flu, if infected, and will infect far more people. Number two, we don't yet know exactly how it's transmitted. Definitely by droplets, but maybe aerosols? Maybe fomites? For now, best practice in the non-healthcare setting is mask, distance, and hand washing. Number three, we don't fully understand why and how it causes a wide variety of clinical syndromes. For example, although we have growing clinical knowledge, the new multi-inflammatory syndrome observed in kids is very much a black box. Number four, relatedly, we don't know what works to treat COVID-19. Remdesivir may decrease hospitalizations, pronin may decrease intubations, hydroxychloroquine worsens outcomes, plasma from recovered patients, maybe. And that's all we've got, folks, still waiting on hundreds of ongoing trials. 
Number five, we're not totally sure about the efficacy of those homemade masks. We know that masks work, period, but what kind of fabric masks work, for whom, at what distance, still TBD. Wear them, but don't feel immune. Number six, we don't yet know how long immunity lasts. Once you get it once, will you be immune for a month, a year, a lifetime? Will this be like the common cold or like smallpox? We're hoping for the latter. Number seven, we don't know how long people are infectious. And number eight, we of course don't yet know when, whether, we'll have a safe and effective vaccine. But she adds, please, for the love of God, once we have one, get vaccinated. End quote. And now moving on to her short list of things that we do know, quote, number one, we know the virus's genome. Number two, we know that to decrease transmission and deaths, we need a combo of A, social distancing, B, testing, C, isolation and contact tracing of sick people, D, adequate PPE. And if we can increase B, C, and D, that is, testing, isolation, and contact tracing of sick people and adequate PPE, then A, social distancing is not so necessary. Without these standard public health measures, we'll see new hotspots emerge, watch infections and deaths balloon, and we'll be right back where we were in mid-March in the U.S. Number three, we also know that if you're close to someone who's infected inside for a period of time, you too have a high risk of infection. And one selfish person who goes out and about when ill can get a lot of other people really sick. Number four, lastly, we know that underlying social and economic inequalities worsen disease. So where does that all leave us? Number one, keep doing and funding science. Two, insist that state and federal governments increase testing so you can go back to work. Three, fund public health infrastructure. And four, until then, maintain masks and social distancing to keep yourself and your community safe. End quote. You've likely heard about immunity passports. We've discussed them a bit on this show in the past. The basic idea is that someone who has tested positive for COVID-19 antibodies could be issued some type of certificate allowing them to return to school, work, or other activities which would remain off-limits to those still susceptible to infection. Such passports are really tempting as we think about reopening, but there are a number of downsides. Prime among them is that we're still not positive that people who've recovered and have antibodies are immune, or if so, for how long. And because of that, the WHO cautioned against the use of immunity passports back in April. Still, many nations continue to float the idea or have begun implementing the concept in some form. Natalie Koffler and Francoise Bailey at Nature.com wrote a fairly provocative piece about why immunity passports are a bad idea. I'm going to summarize some of their points, but ultimately, leave it up to you to draw your own conclusions. And to that end, the link to read the full article is in the show notes. So on top of the mystery surrounding whether people with antibodies present are even immune, the authors of this piece also point to the unreliable nature of many antibody tests on the market, which cause a high number of false positives and false negatives both of which are unhelpful in the implementation of immunity tests because you'll have people thinking they're immune when they're not and gaining access to immune-only activities where they can spread the virus, or people thinking they aren't immune when they really are and losing out on being able to contribute to the economic boost that allowing immune people back to work is supposed to endow. Which brings me to another point the authors of this piece make. We don't have anywhere near enough survivors yet for this to truly make a difference in the economy. The WHO estimated in April that only 2-3% to of the global population has recovered from COVID-19. Some hotspots may have seen close to 15% of their populations infected, but those are outliers. And that is not nearly enough to effectively manage or patronize businesses. And while there could be many more people who were asymptomatic and in fact do have antibodies present and are maybe immune, we're nowhere near the testing capacity required to verify the immunity of all those people. Quoting Nature, Even if immunity passports were limited to healthcare workers, the number of tests required could still be unfeasible. The United States, for example, would need more than 16 million such tests. 
At the time of writing, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and U.S. Public Health Laboratories have performed more than 12 million diagnostic tests for SARS-CoV-2, or 3% of the total U.S. population. Even South Korea, a country with high testing rates, had managed to test only 1.5% of its population by May 20th, end quote. Another consideration is that people may be tempted to game the system through document forgery or by purposefully trying to get infected. Because, the authors argue, if we do this, we'll be creating social stratification, the immunoprivileged versus the immunodeprived. And they say because we've seen similar policies in the past and can see how testing access is already playing out, the stratification will inevitably fall, at least partially, along socioeconomic lines. With the wealthy privileged being able to access the tests required to gain a passport, and the more vulnerable poor being left out. Especially considering the short supply of tests that we'd be facing in this scenario. The authors also say that marginalized communities will likely face more scrutiny and discrimination with regards to the immunity passports, as already evidenced by heightened racial profiling occurring around the world during the pandemic, and that the institution of COVID-19 immunity passports could open the door for further breaches of privacy and state-sanctioned discrimination on the basis of personal health data. Immunity passports, they conclude, take an individualistic approach that is contrary to the purpose of public health. We need to work in solidarity, they say, towards effective testing, tracing, and isolating programs, as well as to the development of and free access to a COVID-19 vaccine. So again, read the article. They have a lot of thought-provoking examples from history and current policies around the world, but I will leave it up to you to form an opinion on it. There's a question we've covered a ton on this podcast. When are we going to have a coronavirus vaccine? It's the most important problem we face because solving it means saving lives around the world and getting the global economy back on track. Right now, investors have a unique opportunity to invest early in cutting-edge coronavirus vaccine innovation. How? By investing in MIGVAX with our crowd. MIGVAX has spent the last four years developing successful avian vaccines, so when coronavirus surfaced, MIGVAX quickly pivoted to developing a COVID-19 vaccine. They're now moving forward with clinical trials and working quickly to produce an effective vaccine. Our crowd is investing in the important vaccine work MIGVAX is doing and has made it so accredited investors can join them and invest too. Our Crowd's crowdsourced investing platform gives accredited investors access to early-stage funding rounds in some of the most promising companies around the world. So now you can set up your Our Crowd account for free and invest in pre-IPO companies alongside professional venture capitalists. Learn more about investing in MIGVAX at OurCrowd.com slash good news. Setting up your account is free, and you can get started right now at OurCrowd.com slash good news. Again, that is O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D dot com slash good news. Beachbody On Demand is the easy-to-use streaming service that gives you instant access to over 1,300 super effective workouts you can do right now in your home. And frankly, there's no better time to start a home-based, on-your-schedule, easy-to-do-with-no-pricey-extra-equipment-needed workout regime than right now when you're stuck at home. There are hundreds of effective workouts for all fitness levels ranging from bodybuilding to weight training to cardio hit to yoga, even dance workouts. You can get motivated by celebrity super trainers you know like Tony Horton, Joel Freeman, Jericho McMatthews, and Autumn Calabrese. And you probably know Beachbody for things like P90X, Insanity, and 21 Day Fix. Now check out some of Beachbody's newest programs like Morning Meltdown 100 and 80 Day Obsession and start every day strong. Let's get in shape together. Listeners to this podcast can get a special free trial membership when you text good news to 303030. You'll get full access to this entire platform for free, all the workouts, the nutrition information and support, totally free. Again, just text good news to 303030. And now for some good news. 
The world's oldest living cat turns 32 today. Rubble, a Maine Coon who lives with his owner Michelle Foster in England, was declared the world's oldest verified living cat back in January and continues to hold the title as he turns 32 today. Which also means this cat is two years older than I am, making this story actually the first thing to make me feel young since turning 30 this year, so thanks for that, Rubble. To put Rubble's age in context, indoor cats typically live around 13 to 17 years, with wild outdoor cats living only about 2 to 6 years. A number of cats on record have lived past 30 years old, and the oldest living cat ever recorded was a cat named Cream Puff, who lived to be 38. We'll see if Rubble makes it to that age. So far, his outlook is pretty good. He's in remarkably good health, suffering only from high blood pressure, and he celebrated his birthday with a free checkup and some treats at the vet's office. Set a reminder for 4.33 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, Wednesday the 27th, for the launch of SpaceX's Crew Dragon. Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley will be the first NASA astronauts to go to space aboard a commercial spacecraft. They'll be departing from Launch Pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, which is the same one that was used for Apollo 11 and for the last space shuttle flight on U.S. soil back in 2011. NASA and SpaceX have been working towards this goal for over a decade, so it's a bummer that it's happening at a time when people can't go out to the Kennedy Space Center and watch in person. And seriously, NASA says, please don't try. But fortunately, it will be streamed live on both NASA and SpaceX's websites. Pre-launch coverage from NASA will start at 12.15 p.m. Eastern, and live updates will continue until Behnken and Hurley have docked on the International Space Station around 11.30 p.m. Eastern on Thursday. However, this is an instantaneous launch window, which means that if they can't launch exactly on time, they will push it to another day, specifically this Saturday, May 30th. And to launch on time, the weather has to be perfect, quoting Wired. NASA has a long list of weather criteria that must be met, which includes calm seas downrange from the launch pad. That means that weather not only has to be good in Florida, but across the Atlantic as well. I'd expect a very high chance of scrubbing the launch due to weather, Benji Reed, SpaceX's director of crew mission management, told reporters earlier this month, end quote. Right now, Cape Canaveral forecasters are predicting a 60% chance of suboptimal conditions for the launch, but also point out that Florida's weather is fickle and anything could happen. This launch is historic for being the start of commercially operated crewed rocket launches. Space is a changing market, and as more players are able to throw their hats in the ring, there's one problem that will just keep getting worse. Space litter. A new paper published in the interdisciplinary journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences proposes that the most effective way to tackle the problem of old satellites and debris crowding low Earth orbit is to institute an internationally agreed upon orbital use fee. While solutions to actually clean up the space junk or bring satellites back to Earth with lasers or harpoon-like devices might work, the economists who published this study consider that a band-aid solution. The real issue, they say, is that satellite operators aren't considering the consequences of their actions on other operators when they launch their satellites. All of the debris left in orbit makes subsequent satellite launches more expensive. An orbit tax, the researchers say, would incentivize satellite operators to be more cautious and considerate of others. Quoting Sky News, The annual fee, rising to $235,000 annually per satellite, would quadruple the value of the satellite industry by 2040, claimed the researchers. And, quote, The impact of reducing collisions and collision-related costs would help drive the satellite industry from the $600 billion market it is projected to become by 2040 to a $3 trillion one, end quote. And to really work, every country around the world that launches satellites would have to be on board. But the researchers say there's precedent for this in similar approaches for carbon emissions and fisheries management. It's an interesting proposal and marks just another way the economy of space is evolving. 
And if you're not all spaced out by the time the Crew Dragon makes it to the International Space Station Thursday evening, Netflix's new comedy series Space Force, starring Steve Carell, Lisa Kudrow, John Malkovich, Ben Schwartz, and a whole bunch of others, is dropping on Friday, so you can queue that up to enjoy all weekend long. But again, the SpaceX launch, if it goes down, will be at exactly 4.33 p.m. Eastern, tomorrow, the 27th, and can be watched live on NASA's or SpaceX's websites. As we've mentioned before, religious leaders are having to find ways to adapt and innovate in the age of corona. And a recent innovation being shared on Twitter might just be my favorite yet. Catholic priests wielding squirt guns full of holy water at drive-by parishioners and squalling babies. The idea may have originated with Detroit-based Father Timothy R. Pelk, who used a water gun to bless baskets of Easter food as his parishioners drove by in their cars. Quoting AV Club, Pelk says he ran the idea by a doctor friend after considering using branches and sprinklers and went forward with the water gun because it, quote, allowed the dose without any cross-contamination. Unlike the other priests pictured, Pelk says that even though he has baptisms scheduled for this week, he does not intend to use the squirt gun, saying in true Catholic fashion that he's, quote, retired it because I enjoyed it so much, end quote. There have since been an increasing number of priests documented on social media adopting this method of holy water dispersal. You should absolutely check out the link in the show notes for photos of parents holding their babies out at arm's reach while a priest with a super soaker blasts jets of holy water from a safe distance. I mean, I just can't wait until we hear an official decree from the Pope on this new strategy. Maybe we'll see him emerge into St. Peter's Square with a super soaker in each arm, blasting all the socially distanced parishioners with streams of holy water. And as I say that, I can't believe that is actually a real possibility and not just a page out of a comic book or something. What a world we suddenly live in. And finally today, good news if you're a 2020 grad or quarantining with one. Pizza Hut has partnered with Americans Dairy Farmers to give away 500,000 free pizzas to the first graduates who sign up on their website. When you do, you'll get a coupon for a free medium one-topping pizza, delivery fees and taxes not included. I love this because it feels like a really poetic conclusion for any 2020 seniors who grew up participating in the Book It program. You don't even have to submit your reading log this time. All you had to do was graduate. And no kid-sized personal pan pizza this time. You're going to get your own full-size pie all to yourself. And while you're enjoying your free pizza, or if this segment has now made you crave pizza delivery, check out the link in the show notes for a video tutorial from Bruce Yanni of Homemade Science on how to make a pizza box walk down a ramp all on its own. Watching the box scurry down the ramp somehow gives it way more anthropomorphic personality than I ever expected to see from a pizza box. That is all for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media, the daily podcast people. I'm Jackson Bird. I hope you had a great three-day weekend and have a good rest of your day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.